the blood god's domain. I saw constant battle, man fought demon, lightning fought volcano, gazes of molten brass fought lakes of steaming blood. There was no respite, no peace. That which emerged victorious was immediately set upon by another foe, even more terrible. It was blood, spraying and jetting, skulls adding to a throne that pierced the red skies. It was endless screams of rage and fury made incarnate. It was glorious. From the Sarg slept, a vision geist of the encrusted blade. Though the demon-filled battlefields of the blood god's domain, Korn's home in the realm of chaos, are many and each is vast beyond reckoning, there is more to this blasted land than just blood-soaked plains populated with warring demons. Violence and despair are constant traveling companions for any unfortunate soul cursed to briefly wander there. Each foreboding hellscape leads to another more grim than the last. At the heart of it all, Corn watches from its skull throne, surveying its lands and pitting its forces against any convenient foe. Be they fellow demons or foolhardy invaders who seek to wage a doomed war on the Lord of Battle. The Blood God's Domain is a realm unlike any other. Storms rage perpetually across crimson skies, sending gale force blasts seemingly composed of pure rage whipping across the plains and mountains. These angry winds tear into the land itself and rip up great chunks of stone and blood-drenched earth tossing them violently back down hundreds of leagues away in explosions of raw destruction. The land, for its part, fights back against the brutal assault of the heavens. Earthquakes send gouts of molten brass skyward, burning up the storm clouds, temporarily ending their rage until the winds regather to begin their assaults anew. New mountains erupt from flat land in an instant, some thrusting into the sky like gigantic living swords, others acting as shields against the advance of the storms. Rivers of boiling blood crisscross the hellish landscape, dividing the realm into territories over which rival bloodthirsters wage war. The blood flows are not content to allow the conquered lands to rest idle. From deep below the ground, new rivers strike through the surface, splitting the lands as easily as an axe opens the bloated gut of a lazy bureaucrat. Each crimson flow sucks down all that once occupied the space, including any demonic legions that might have been marching there. As with its war against the sky, the land retaliates, pushing the banks of the rivers to close in upon themselves. The brass spewing volcanoes send liquid metal into the rivers, evaporating the blood within and sealing the wounds with burning fury. Each piece of the realm of battle constantly fights to obliterate the others. Each acts like a living servant of court wanting to prove to the master of the land that it is the most worthy of the gods' rewards. A visitor to this nightmare realm would surely be driven mad, knowing that every rock, every breeze, and every drop of what should be water is an enemy, looking to kill him with just as much purpose, desire, and violence as the multitudes of demons inhabiting the land. To witness the carnage of the realm of Korn is to know that conflict is a living, breathing thing and not just a curse that troubles the world of men, machines, and aliens. It is to know an eternal truth and thus to know despair. 
Corn's rage. At the outermost edge of the Blood God's domain, there lies a ring of volcanoes that scholars of the profane have come to call Corn's rage. Reaching hundreds of kilometers into the air, they belch their thick black smoke and molten brass skyward, creating an impenetrable border that can neither be seen through nor navigated. Darkness and ash hang there, lit ominously from beneath by gouts of flame that incinerate the loose debris along the sides of the volcanoes. Within the ash cloud, blood storms roil. Red lightning dances across the clouds as thunder cracks and rolls, like the snap of a bloodthirster's whip, followed by the sound of the hooves of a thousand charging juggernauts. These peaks stand as a bastion against invaders. Their toxic ash and scorching brass flows enough to deter all but the most determined of forces. Those who are arrogant or foolish enough to make the attempt to cross the torturous border are met with more than barriers of heat and jagged rock. The very rock and brass of Korn's rage itself rises up to crush the attackers. Pieces of the rock break away from the side of the mountains, molten brass flowing into them in a hellish semblance of lifeblood. Demons of stone and liquid metal take form, born of rage and defiance. With mindless fury and unadulterated violence, they bludgeon and scorch their foes. Once their grim task is complete, they fall back into lifeless piles, waiting for the call to reform and defend the borders of their master's realm. The Demon Forges At the base of the volcanoes are the forges of the lesser furnace demons. In these sweltering workshops, weapons of war are crafted. All manner of axes, swords, hammers, and armor are created to supply the blood god's eternal wars. Here too, the components of Korn's demon engines are made. Assembly of these huge constructs of war is conducted elsewhere, but the cogs, blades, housings, and armaments all have their beginning here, at the foot of Korn's rage. It is a dangerous place to reside, even by the standards of the rest of the realm. At any moment, a volcano could erupt, flooding the forge with molten brass, it is of no concern to corn if a few demons are incinerated in such mishaps. Others rise from the blood pits to take their place, and the forges continue. Despite the risks, the furnace demons are able to take advantage of the dangers of its rage. Across the plains of battle, it is almost exclusively corn's own minions that do battle and perish. At the fringes of the realm, however, other warriors die agonizing, terrible, bloody deaths. Using tools of fiendish design and rites that even the most depraved chaos sorcerers would dare not undertake, the masters of the hell forges enslave the souls of those mortals who would dare invade the blood god's realm and fuse them with the anvils of corn. The tormented screams of those thus eternally imprisoned blend with the ringing and clanging of each falling hammer that strikes the forge. When white hot metal is placed on the anvil and pounded into form, the bound soul feels the scorching heat. Thus, as each new weapon or piece of armor is crafted in the demon forges, it is born to the sound of Korn's enemies suffering the gods' everlasting wrath. The Blood Pits Warp energy, the raw stuff of chaos. 
thoughts constantly swirls across the realms of all the greater chaos gods. Its currents and eddies shift and meander seemingly at random, causing mutation within the very land itself and everyone and everything they touch. In most cases, this power does not linger in any one place for long. There are, however, locations throughout the Blood God's treacherous domain where the power of the warp collects and stirs. When this happens, great craters are often gouged into the blasted plains. None can say if it takes moments or millennia for these pits to form, or time is meaningless within the realm of chaos. Eventually, the warp storms break apart, sometimes seeping into the very pits they created. When this happens, Korn commands his minions to intensify their efforts to harvest blood from the mortal world, using the most violent, destructive, and devastating methods they can possibly bring to bear. The souls that perish in such a campaign give their blood to a special dark cause. Their crimson essence is collected in the pit, where it is mixed with molten brass and the measure of Korn's own murderous bile. The resultant lake is a new blood pit. It is from the blood pits that new demons of Korn arise. Bloodletters, furnace demons, and many lesser fiends steadily emerge from the warp and bile and fuse blood, ready to do their master's bidding. The soldiers that vomit forth from that pit will be charged from the day of their creation until the day they fail their master in combat with claiming more blood to refill their pit. Eventually, a pit goes dry. But without fail, soon after it does, a new storm begins to brew, restarting the cycle of bloodshed. The Rivers of Blood Dividing one region of Korn's realm from another like jagged crimson scars on the scorched land are the Rivers of Blood. These kilometer-wide flows are filled with the blood of those who have fallen in service to Korn. Be they victims or followers, nearly all blood that is shed on the gods' behalf on the mortal plane finds its way to these sanguine canals. The blood itself is hot to the point of boiling. Steam made of vaporized blood hangs in the air all along the length of the rivers, creating a palpable red cast to the regions through which they run. Gigantic bubbles rise to the surface, carrying with them occasional remains of something that was unfortunate enough to have fallen into it. As the bubbles burst, globules of steaming, Hot blood launched hundreds of feet into the air, coming back to the ground and landing on the shores in splatter patterns that often resemble the spray of an opened artery. The Lake of Slaughter Thousands of blood rivers cut through the land and end up emptying over a bleak precipice kilometers high. Plunging downward in waterfalls of gore, the lake that forms at the base of the wall is larger than any ocean in the mortal realm and populated with creatures that cannot be. Leviathans of brass and bone swim through the lake, devouring all as they pass. Soaring above the lake, bloodthirsters fight with dragons of pure solid blood. Those that stray too close to the surface of the lake risk being snatched out of the air by the very lake itself. Rising waves on the surface take the shape of warriors and do battle, crashing violently into each other and falling back to the surface in a rain of scattered blood. The Brass Citadel On the far shore of the Lake of Slaughter, the ground is littered with skulls, so many in fact, 
that whatever foundation may lie beneath them cannot be touched. For kilometers, these skulls stretch away from the shore, and in the distance, there rises a great black wall. This is the outer wall of Korn's Brass Citadel. Upon the wall stand guardian demons, with eyes as sharp as their fangs and swords. They watch for any intruder ready to defend their master to the last. Within the walls there are thousands of flesh hounds patrolling the skull yard, sniffing out the blood scent of any who would dare attempt incursion. In the skies, flying between the outer walls and the inner keep, Elite bloodthirsters listen for sounds of invasion on the wind. It is rare that any force musters the strength to assault the Brass Fortress, its guardians deterring all but the most foolish or daring of Korn's rivals from even trying. When the attempt is made, the might of the Blood God's personal host is brought to bear with a fury and rage that threatens to rip a hole between realms. While Korn's brother Chaos Gods could gain much power should they defeat the Blood God in its fortress, the risk of a counter-invasion is too great for such wars to be waged without a dire cause. It is said that if Korn itself should rouse from its throne and personally go to war against the other dark gods, its favored blade would end them all in one mighty sweep, but that such an act would have calamitous results that not even Zeej could predict. It is said that Korn was once consumed by such rage that it took up its sword and smote the ground, splitting it asunder for eternity. This fell sword is known by many names, including Warmaker and the End of All Things, and is capable of laying waste to entire worlds with a single blow. Because of this, an uneasy state of balance exists between the Runer's powers. When it does obliterate the invading armies of its brother gods, they do not exact retribution directly. When the threat is ended, neither does Korn press the advantage, but rather turns back towards its inner sanctum and reclaims its place atop the throne of skulls. Thus is balance maintained in the eternal great game. The Throne of Skulls In the very center of the Brass Citadel, beyond the Bastion Stair and the Eight Iron Pillars, Korn watches over all its minions from the Guard's Seat on the Throne of Skulls. From there, it commands its Blood Legions and Mortal Servants to bring war to the distant corners of the galaxy. Every victory it witnesses leaves it thirsting for more blood. With every defeat, Korn takes the blood of a failed champion and adds it to the rivers of its realm. Blood will be Korn's. If the god must harvest it from its own minions, so be it. Surrounding the throne of skulls on all sides is a mound of skulls that holds it aloft on its perch. Cornered chaos champions and fallen enemies alike contribute to the mass of bone. Could these skulls speak? Some would tell tales from before the long war against what they call the Corpse Emperor of the Imperium when the Primarch Angren had yet to swear his oath to the Blood God. Others would speak of grave mistakes that caused their entire species to fall to the axes of legions of berserkers. The skulls closest to the God, those of its favored champions who have perished in service to their lord after hundreds of violent campaigns, would call out across eternity once more bellowing their war cry, Blood for the Blood God.